Uh, Robert, please begin. Thank you. Why did the Greeks defile the oil? Our sages described the miracle of Hanukkah as follows. During their occupation of the Holy Land, the Greeks entered the Chaikol, the sanctuary in the base Hamikdash, and defiled all the vessels of olive oil they found. After their defeat, the Maccabees were able to find only one cruise of oil with the seal of the high priest intact. Though it contained enough oil for only one day, the rekindled menorah burned miraculously for eight days, enough time for new oil to be prepared. The Talmud clearly indicates that the Greeks' defiling of the oil was intentional and systematic. They neither used it nor destroyed it. What did they gain by defiling it? We might add to the question, it's not a question of what did they gain. Um, we would just would have expected them to have ransacked the place and just slashed it. Now, how did they defile it? By just simply opening them. They have exposing it and touching it. That would make it ritually impure. So why would they bother? You know, just burn it, destroy it as the Romans did centuries later. Continue. A spiritual conflict. This question can be answered by analyzing the nature of the conflict between the Greeks and the Jews. While building their empire, the Greeks did not usually attempt to eradicate indigenous populations. Their goal was to Hellenize and assimilate them into their culture. This was their policy when they imposed their rule over Eretz Israel. Alexander who had since died, but he was a, a benevolent a conqueror. Um, the objective was to colonize uh, other countries and incorporate, incorporate them in the great Greek empire, but not destroy them, but rather um, enlighten them and bring the world to the, to, to the new age, the age of reason and sports and uh, architecture and what have you, art, science. That was the battle. That was the battle. So continue. This is why the prayer beginning Ve'al Hanasim states that the Greeks were the Greeks endeavored to force the Jews to forget your Torah and violate the decrees of your will. They see the, the word the word your is italicized because they didn't mind Torah as a culture, as a philosophy, um, as a as a moral system, as an economic system, and all of the virtues that Torah contains. That's where it starts and ends, that's fine. Your Torah, it's divine, immutable, godly, at, at the core, beyond understanding, at its core, that they were opposed to, for they believe that everything in the end can be re reduced to numbers, all can be figured out. Nature is the ultimate reality. There's not beyond nature. And that was the whole war. To forget that the Torah is, continue. To forget the Torah as it is connected to God. The Greeks appreciated the wisdom and beauty of the Torah. What they opposed was the concept of Torah as godly revelation. They would have liked the Jewish people to study Torah in the same way they would have studied human wisdom, insensitive to its godliness that transcends the bounds of intellect. Well, more than insensitive, they just denied its existence altogether. And that was the battle. And I should tell you, dear friends, that the real miracle of Hanukkah, this may come as a shock to you, was when we say in this very Alanism prayer that you quoted from, that we thank and praise God for handing over the many into the hands of the few. In other words, the few prevailed over the many. We're not talking about the Greeks. When we praise God for that the impure were handed over to the, into the hands of the pure, we're not talking about the Greeks and the Jews. It's the Jews. The majority of Jews that embraced the Greek overtures and couldn't understand the problem. I mean, we're just bringing Judaism into the modern era. In fact, they considered, the vast majority of Jews considered the Maccabees to be not only a nuisance, not only an embarrassment, but the cause of anti-Jewish feeling. What's this resistance? Things be, um, the embrace, the embrace of the Greek culture, the Hellenization uh, of Jewry, the assimilation of Jewry at the time was so uh, all pervasive that young Jews sought to reverse their circumcision. Their sports activities, of course, were uh, uh, played naked. The body was 
celebrated, the physical body per se, all physical things were celebrated, its beauty and form, and they were embarrassed with their bris, and so they sought to reverse it. Have they all you know, abandoned Judaism? No, this is the new Judaism. This is, this is the cool Judaism. This is the Judaism of the new era. This is the liberal Judaism. This is the woke Judaism. And I do not exaggerate. It's precisely the same story. And the Maccabees were considerably unwoke and clung tenaciously to Jewish values, refusing to compromise. And for the rest of the jury, they were uh, a thorn. And moreover, the cause of anti-Semitism, your insistence on being different, your insistence on some divine, eternal truth, um, that's, what's causing, that's what's causing them to hate us. I want to tell you something that we're talking about lately in our, in our, anti, uh, in our course that we gave, outsmarting, we're in the middle of almost concluded outsmarting anti-Semitism. Friends, I'm seeing this today amongst our youth. I spoke about Rosh Hashanah and Shul, and it, 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 it uh, ruffled a lot of feathers because people were shocked and didn't want to hear this. And that is, this is happening today and to the following extreme. It wasn't long ago, I'm talking a few years ago, where the establishment, you and I included, believed if we just took our children on the march of the living into Israel, that's it. They'd be uh, proud Jews and marry Jewish and support Jewish causes and, and um, Jewish continuity would be assured. Take them to, to Auschwitz and so on. You know what's happening now? The opposite. The opposite. The opposite result. You know what's happening? What's creeping in slowly but surely and insidiously? You take them to Auschwitz and the feeling is, well, we asked for it because we were different. Our insistence on being Jewish and that there was any kind of difference, that's what brought this on. If you would just be woke and liberal and there are no differences between anything or anybody, it's all uh, chosen and you can embrace and, and, and divest oneself, male, female, you are your, your choice. In other words, nothing is hard core. Nothing is immutable. There are no boundaries. There are no differences. There is no heaven. There's no hell, to quote John Lennon. Nothing to live or die for. Um, then there'd be nothing to live or die for. And the problem was the ghettos, the Jews, even the cultural Jews that insisted on, insisted on their culture and language. That's what brought on the Holocaust. So it's the opposite. They're going to the museum and they're seeing how Jews lived. That's the problem. It has the opposite effect. That's because if we don't give our children a real reason to be Jewish, it's cultural persecution is not the reason. Be Jewish because they gassed us. Well, they gassed us because we were Jewish. So let's stop being Jewish in this way that will create these divisions. That's the result. So what's the answer? The answer is the story of Hanukkah. Why be Jewish? What is Jewish? What is God? What's the purpose of creation? And then discover the dignity of difference, to quote Jonathan Sachs, and the role of the Jew as representative of God on earth. And that there are men and there are women and there are differences. And that's the beauty. That's the symphony. That's the mosaic of life. Not tearing down differences, respecting them. Not using differences as barriers. Not as barriers. But as respect. Respecting space. Respecting unique roles. This is not a new battle. It's the story of Hanukkah. It's also the story of communist Russia. Most Jews embraced communism like the Greeks, the Jews embraced the Hellenism. They kept Jewish culturally, but they sought to destroy all divinity, these immutable differences, uh, missions, purposes. Nothing is eternal. Things change. The world evolves. It all comes down to Darwinism, really. Things evolve. And Nazism is the, the bastard, or not even the bastard child, but Nazism is the child of Darwinism, of contemporary science, because Nazism believes that the Aryan race is the most evolved species or within the human race, and that's the destiny of humanity. And uh, the, the sub-races have to serve 
the superior. It's the law of the jungle, the law of life, the law of evolution. And the Jew is the cancer because the Jew insists that all know all life is sacred, equally valuable, um, and 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 sacred, infinitely valuable. It's not just part of an evolutionary chain, but every human being is independently and intrinsically, um, infinitely precious to God. Every human being, and no human human life is in essence more valuable, different, but not more valuable than any other. We have we have different purposes. But each purpose is indispensable because we're all made in the image of God. For Hitler, Jew was the cancer and communism was the bastard child, insistent on everybody being equal. That's why he hated communism because comrade, everybody's the same. No, they're not. It's evolution. Nietzsche uh, was the great advocate of, uh, uh, of this, this concept of the humanity evolving, the world evolving. And the Jew stands in its way. So communism was the same battle over again, like Hanukkah. And today, the liberal woke left, it's the same thing, which is why Israel is severely targeted. Because Israel is a thorn in this whole idea of a Jewish state. What? No such thing as a Jewish state. No such thing as a Jew. There are no differences. That's why you look wherever wherever you, the, the bastions, the inspiration of the liberal woke left, it's BDS, it's anti-Israel, it's pro-Palestinian. Israel is the new enemy. We are the champions of, of equality. Equality means we're all the same. And by calling it a Jewish state, you're saying you're not. You're saying there's difference. Israel's got to go. That's first on the agenda of the liberal left. It's the same story of Hanukkah all over again. And, and Jews were at the forefront. Jews are the champions of this. On, on campuses, in the media, CNN, and other places. It's so Jewish. New York Times, even better than that. Same story as Hanukkah. Same story. The miracle was then, as will be now. The truth prevails. The many in the hands of the few. Thank God the few are growing and growing and growing. Okay, let's continue with the few minutes that we have left or whatever it is. Ricky, then, then the decrees of your will. Okay, one second. Um, could you just tell me where we are? The decrees of your will. Oh. I think it's the third section. <clears throat> yeah. Likewise, the Greeks did not object to the fulfillment of the commandments per se, recognizing that every culture, including their own, has rituals. Their antagonism was aroused by the idea that mitzvahs are a unique means of connecting to God, which take us beyond human limits. This idea is alluded to in the phrase from the Va'al Hanisim, which speaks of Kuke Ritzonecha, the decrees of your will. There are three categories of commandments, mishpatim, judgments, edos, testimonials, and chukim, decrees. Mishpatim <clears throat> are the mitzvahs which appeal to reason, such as the prohibitions against theft and murder. The edos commemorate events in Jewish history, a means of reliving the past and grasping its significance, for example, eating matzah on Pesach. The chukim are those mitzvahs which are super rational, a decree from me, which you have no permission to question. The edos and the mishpatim enable us to relate to God through means we can rationally appreciate. The chukim, by contrast, require us to rise above the limitations of our understanding. And when we do so, <clears throat> these mitzvahs connect us with God's infinite dimension. It was the observance of the chukim that irked the Greek mentality and countered their philosophy. Yeah, he's saying the same, you know, the different ways to express this. So but in essence, what I said earlier is really what he's saying over here. What irked the Greeks is this notion of an eternal, transcendent, not subject to human rational truth. That there is a God and a purpose and there are creations in God's world and each one has its unique contribution. That was the whole battle. So as we just heard, as Ricky just read, 
the, the Halanissim points out that which aspect of Judaism did they, was the battle, not the first two. The first two they agreed, you know, the logical laws, for sure. The laws that recall, recall history, that too has a place. History, culture, culture evolves from history. So the, the Greeks embraced and, and fully um, supported observing Judaism on level one and two. But it's the third category, divine, immutable, eternal, no such thing. We're going to, we're going to liberate you from the shackles of, of your imprisoning faith. That was the battle. In light of this, it can read another section, please, Ricky. Impure light and the battle against it. In light of this, <clears throat> we can understand why the Greeks were so intent on defiling the oil. They wanted the menorah to be lit with impure oil so that its light, symbolic of the light of Torah, would shine forth not in its pristine purity, but with a human Greek touch. The Jews responded to this challenge with Messiris Nefesh. Well, yeah, if just, uh, Ricky, just, uh, just to add some clarification, elaboration rather. They said, the Greeks, light the oil. It's the same oil as your so-called pure oil. There's no such thing as pure and impure in a spiritual sense. Put it under a microscope and, and subject it to every rigorous scientific analysis. The oil we touched is no different than the oil in your in your, uh, that you have in your, your so-called pure oil. Again, it's the war on the transcendent, the eternal, the spiritual, the beyond, beyond the senses, beyond logic. Continue, so the Jews responded to this challenge. The Jews responded to this challenge with Messiris Nefesh, self-sacrifice that leaps beyond the limits of reason. Though they were pitted against the world's strongest military power, they were determined to fight and even to surrender their lives in order to be able to study your Torah and carry out the decrees of your will. Good. Um, okay. Any volunteer to read? Where, where? I want to call on someone and Robert, Robert, oh, Robert Burke is a good, he's a traditional reader. Go ahead. The power of a single cruise of oil. This power of Masuris Nefesh is symbolized by the one cruise of oil, which still bore the seal of the high priest. In describing the obligations of the high priest, the Rambam writes, his glory is to reside in the base Hamikdash throughout the day and to go home only at night. His home must be in Jerusalem and he may not depart from it. So now Reb is going to explain the profound symbolic spiritual meaning of the fact that this cruise of oil bore the seal of the high priest. In other words, and if it bore the seal of any ordinary priest, it would also qualify as kosher. But the point really was that the seal wasn't broken altogether. So it didn't have to have the seal of anyone. Just like the, the wine, as long as the wine is, is, the, is covered, it's impervious to impurity. So what's the significance that it bore the seal of the high priest? The answer is, who was the high priest? He resided in Yerushalayim and may not depart from it. What's Yerushalayim? What's Jerusalem? Continue. The name Yerushalayim is a composite of the two Hebrew words Yira and Shalem, together implying complete awe. That's a translation. So Yira means awe and Shalem means peace or complete or whole. Continue. The fact that the high priest never leaves Jerusalem means that he never abandons his all in, this all-encompassing fear of God. Within each of our hearts, we all possess a similar quality. We too can relate to God with the intensity of the high priest. Continue. The potential to attain this level is our one cruise of oil. What's that? It is, it is hidden in every individual, begging to be discovered. Although a person might not uncover his internal connection to God in the ordinary circumstances of his life, when challenged, as in the case of the Maccabees, this inner connection will surface. And when this divine bond comes to the fore, God will deliver the mighty into the hands of the weak, the many into the hands of the few, for nothing can withstand its power. 
So when we, when we say nothing can withstand its power, um, we don't mean like, you know, some kind of, uh, you see in the movies, uh, some uh, holding some power that people surrender and, and, are, and are destroyed miraculously. Uh, like, you know, kryptonite cripples uh, Superman. We mean by nothing can stand, withstand its power is the truth, the truth is such that no one can resist and all want to be a part of it. All want to be a part of it because it's the, the truth and their truth because truth is everyone's truth. And the truth is Hashem, the creator of all things. So he's saying that when the Jew reveals this cruise of oil, that's the neshama, the soul that we all possess. How do we reveal that? Through Torah and through mitzvahs, we become very attractive. Everybody wants to be part of this. If it's an agenda-laden Judaism, then no. But if it's the pure Judaism, it's not just a cultural one, but the authentic, pure oil, then wow, everybody in the end is attracted and wants to be part of it. And that's the answer to anti-Semitism. That's the answer to reaching out to our fellow Jews for that matter too, of course, is with absolute humility and sincerity and, ex and expressive of our pure soul within, which touches the pure soul within them. That's what touches it. When we, when we touch them, touch their core by revealing our own core. And what does that? Sacrifice, devotion, humility expressed in Torah mitzvahs. Let's conclude. In their struggle against the Greeks. In their struggle against the Greeks, the Maccabees tapped this resource, this single cruise of oil revealing a level of soul that transcended their usual limits. In response, God revealed forces that transcended the natural limits of this world. Thank you. Maybe uh, I never asked uh, Tema to read the last paragraph. Tema, you with us there? I am Rabbi New, but I, I didn't download it on time. Oh, okay. All right. All right. So we'll just listen then. So uh, Robert, continue that. Conclude. The Hanukkah miracle which followed serves as an eternal testimony to the essential connection to God that the Greeks sought to sever. In our day as well, the Hanukkah lights remind us that through your Torah and the decrees of your will, through an appreciation of the infinite dimension of the Torah and its commandments, we can develop a complete connection with God. Succeeding in this will lead us to the time when our bond with God will encompass all existence for the earth will be filled with the knowledge of God as the waters cover the ocean bed with the coming of the redemption. May this take place in the immediate future. Yeah, so he's saying when we reveal our souls through Torah and mitzvahs, then this is transformative. This touches the soul in every, in our fellow Jew and every human being. And all the negativity is transformed into light. We light up the darkest corners of the world and that's the redemption that that comes from a Judaism that is lived, that is expressive of its true, divine, eternal depth, which was the whole battle and then victory of Hanukkah. Thank you all for, for joining today. God willing, we'll see you in the course of the week in good health. Thank Happy you. end of Hanukkah. <clears throat> good Chodesh, good luck. Chodesh as well. Thank you. Yes. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you for our readers. Thank you. And may the Nish Rabbi, maybe the Neshama of um, Leah Bas Yosef, if Lillian asks you, lay short, may her Neshama have an Aliyah from the learning as well. Amen. 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 We lost three young women this week. Devastating, devastating. Shira Malka, Bas Alexander, and uh, Monique on the EFMTC, all, all connected to MTC. Yeah. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. All right, let's hear good yeah. news. Yeah, we need Mashiach now. Amen. Yeah, and Amen. they should, our Neshama should be back soon. Amen. 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 Thank Amen. you. Bye-bye. Hmm. Bye. -bye. Bye.